A growing number of Republicans and religious groups are speaking out against Donald Trump's dinner with Holocaust denier Nicholas Fuentes and disgraced rapper Kanye West. And I semite. The New York Times reports, quote, even some of Mr. Trump's staunchest supporters say they can no longer ignore the abetting of bigotry by the nominal leader of the Republican Party. Not all Republican leaders have spoken out, but Jewish Republicans are slowly peeling away from a former president who for years insisted he had no ties to the bigoted far right, but refused to repudiate it. Morton Klein, the head of the right wing Zionist organization, of America told the paper, Donald Trump is not an anti-Semite. He, anti he loves Israel. He loves Jews. But he mainstreams, he legitimizes Jew hatred and Jew haters. And this scares me. It's really, it's a good way to put it, even if you want to say, you know, he was pro-Israel in his policy, doesn't hate Jews, but he mainstreams the hatred of Jews for political purposes. He mainstreams anti-Semitism for political purposes. He mainstreams white uh, nationalism for political purposes. It doesn't really matter what his personal feelings are. If he's promoting that exactly. hatred, that leads to, to Jewish Americans and Jews across the world being in more danger. Promoting that ha hatred and, and welcoming that kind of hatred yeah. into his home. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, in an interview yesterday, former Vice President Mike Pence denounced Trump's actions. While on Capitol Hill, several Senate Republicans also criticized their party's leader. It's wrong uh, uh, to give uh, a white nationalist uh, um, an anti-Semite and a Holocaust denier a seat at the table. And uh, I think he should apologize for it, uh, and he should denounce those individuals uh, uh, and their hateful rhetoric without qualification. I think the president demonstrated uh, profoundly poor judgment uh, in, in giving those individuals a seat at the table. The meeting was bad. He shouldn't have done it. But again, you know, there's a double standard about this kind of stuff, and I don't think it'll matter um, in terms of his political future. But I do believe we need to watch who we meet with. I wouldn't want to have dinner with either one of those guys, or I wouldn't meet with either one of those guys. You make the most of that you want to. He surely would disavow any of that stuff. Most would. Uh, how he took a meeting, I don't know. There's no room in the Republican Party for white supremacist, anti-Semitism, so it's wrong. I think it's ridiculous that he had that meeting. Just, it's ridiculous. And that's, that's all I'm going to say about it. Just crazy. Good for Johnny Ernst. Mitt Romney also very dumb. I do want to go back, though. This both sides is some BS that Lindsey Graham tried to trot out there. What was that? Yeah, you know, the thing is, people, are, people have been saying them since this has come up. They talk about Ilana Omar. And some of the things that she said, um, Jonathan O'Meara, if I'm not mistaken, Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic leadership and the media and everybody else in America jumped on Ilhan Omar's comments immediately, were very critical of her, took her to task. The media did the same thing. There's no double standard here. The double standard is that, you know, or, or, or the difference between Republicans and Democrats are all the Democrats seem to come out. Leaders came out criticizing Ilhan Omar's statement, right, or statements. And yet Republicans are mute. Or Lindsey Graham's giving one of these sort of half-assed remarks. It's just it's like, it's, it's just... It's sad. It's pathetic. It's just what Lindsey Graham does. Yeah, what about as a central plank for a number of Republicans right now? Ilhan Omar is a good example. Democrats did criticize what she had to say. And then let's recall, of course, it wasn't all that much longer when Donald Trump singled her out at a rally and she started receiving death threats because of what he said about her, about how she should go back to her own country. We had another example not that long ago, just before the election, of both sides. The attack on Paul Pelosi, 
the husband of Speaker Nancy Pelosi and how there was criticism that the Republicans claimed that when Steve Scalise was shot by a liberal, a supporter then of Bernie Sanders, that Democrats didn't do anything. Well, that's not true. And we played on the show the statements from Nancy Pelosi and also Senator Sanders denouncing what happened and said violence should never happen in, in politics name and that how it was not met with the same sort of forceful denunciation we got after the Pelosi attack. So this is, right. yes, it was good that we got some Republicans unequivocally say this was bad, but so many others still hedging their bets, clearly with an eye on these voters, voters for Trump, these hateful voters who they think they might need to. Yeah, and, and what does Donald Trump say? Nancy Pelosi says we're all on the same team here. We're all members of family after Steve Scalise is shot. Oh, yeah. Says she's praying for him. Day. Donald Trump, he goes out. What does he say after Paul Pelosi's beaten up hey, when the guy comes in trying to assassinate the Speaker of the House? What's he go? How? Yeah. How's she doing? It's How's despicable. Nancy doing lately? No, yeah. it's disgusting. And, and so the both sides is doesn't work. But see, here's the good news, everybody. Here's the good news. People understand this. Yeah, even. You look at the voting, you look. Republicans. Republicans are paying the price at the ballot box for all of the things that they're doing like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, just because Republicans aren't saying and aren't condemning Donald Trump for being an anti-Semite and being anti-democratic by, by uh, denying election results— I mean, it, you know, it's like Republicans, they're like babies. They think if they cover their eyes, <laughs> then nobody can see them. Well, there's a growing they number can. of Republicans who are saying something. Joining us now from Capitol Hill, NBC News senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor. Sahil, uh, the Republican criticism of Trump on this front is definitely building. From Senate Republicans, Sahil. Senate Republicans. Don't hear a lot from Republican leaders in the House, do we? Not yet, Joe. We'll see when the House gavels in later today what uh, the House Republicans have to say. We have not notably heard from House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, who's trying to become Speaker of the House. He's leaning in to his right flank, trying to win their votes. But let's go with uh, what Senate Republicans are saying. This one does hit a little bit differently, guys, because it's not just the usual suspects who are criticizing Trump. It is uh, Republicans who are nominal allies of the president who rarely, if ever, criticize him. That includes Joni Ernst, who played what she had to say. She's a member of Senate Republicans and leadership called that dinner ridiculous, that what Trump did, uh, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Shelley Moore Capito also used the same word, uh, ridiculous. Deb Fisher, the senator from Nebraska, uh, said uh, it was wrong to elevate the rhetoric uh, of uh, a white supremacist like Nick Fuentes. You, you played Lindsey Graham. He's a golfing buddy of Donald Trump. Yes, he did both sides of it, but he also said uh, what Trump did was bad and that he shouldn't have done it. These are unusual levels of criticism from Republicans who typically like to just move past a Trump controversy, who say, oh, I I didn't really hear about it. I don't know what he had to say. Um, I don't follow his tweets or, or, or what have you or his social media posts. That's not happening this time around. And there are some particularly sharp criticisms from uh, Republicans like Senator Mitt Romney, who saw this as vindication. Uh, he told me he voted to remove Trump from office two times. He doesn't believe Trump belongs anywhere near the White House, and this only proves it. Let's play a little bit more of what Mitt Romney had to say. I think it's disgusting to invite uh, people like that to meet with a former president of the United States. Um, I think there's, uh, it's been clear that there's no bottom to the degree to which President Trump will uh, degrade uh, himself and, and the nation. And beyond that, there's also Rick Scott and Steve Daines, the outgoing and incoming chairs of the Senate Republican campaign arm, uh, who issued unusual criticisms of Donald Trump, stood up uh, and, and condemned anti-Semitism. One of the reasons this feels different is that it's been a week now since that dinner happened with uh, Nick Fuentes and uh, the rapper Ye, who has been uh, embroiled in all sorts of you know anti-Semitic anti rhetoric. And there's been no apology from Donald Trump. There's been no expression of regret, not even a simple, I messed up, I shouldn't have done it, I apologize. Uh, you know, for, for that. And ordinarily, you know, many Republicans would be willing to look beyond some controversy, but that explanation is not cutting it for a lot of Republicans when the dinner guest is a Holocaust denier and an anti-Semite. This comes, of course, on the heels of an election where, as Joe correctly points out, Republicans were punished for their association with Donald Trump. Our polls showed that many uh, voters voted against Republican candidates because of their proximity to the former president, even though he's out of power, which is extremely unusual. And of course, finally, this, uh, this comes to 
to a question about the soul of the Republican Party. Are they going to tolerate in any form or fashion uh, individuals who uh, promote white supremacy and anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial for political gain? Or is that the, a door they should firmly shut? Many of them believe it's the latter, that they should give no quarter to these individuals. That doesn't really work when your standard bearer is uh, having dinner with them, which is why a lot of Republicans are troubled by this. NBC Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much for your reporting this morning. Yeah, it's going to be so fascinating to see what happens when the House does gavel in later I on. Know. What will Kevin McCarthy do? And, and I think there's there's just. Well, I the, think we know what he'll do. Well, you know the thing is really there. There's this this miscalculation mm -hmm. uh, that usually plays for um, Freedom Caucus types. Uh, and the miscalculation always is, oh, well, Kevin McCarthy just has to give in to their demands, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's fine until suddenly the moderates, the people that won in Joe Biden districts go, hold on a second. If I'm in Marjorie Taylor Greene's Republican Party, if I'm in Nick Fuente's Republican Party, if I'm in Kanye West's Republican Party... I'm going to lose my seat in New York in two years. So suddenly, that's counterbalanced by five, six, seven people on the other side as well. McCarthy can't give up four crazy people on the far right. He can't give up four people from Biden districts. So it's, it's not that easy. I mean, I, I don't know how McCarthy doesn't come out and criticize this meeting later today. Because, again, the media just obsesses on the total crazies on the far right. They forget there are a lot of other Republicans uh, that have to get reelected in two years as well.